Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we're going to be listening to Dr. Pushpa Larson presenting her webinar on DHEA. Dr. Pushpa Larson graduated from Bastyr University with a doctorate in naturopathic medicine and certificates in naturopathic midwifery and spiritually, spirituality, health, and medicine. She has worked at, as a research clinician for the Bastyr University Research Institute and as an affiliate clinical faculty for Bastyr University, training students in her clinic. She was in private practice in Seattle for 10 years before joining Meridian Valley Lab as a consulting physician and maintains a small private practice primarily focused on bioidentical hormone therapy. She consults with hundreds of doctors every year on the use and interpretation of 24-hour urine hormone profiles as well as other tests offered by Meridian Valley Lab. She is a contributing author to the Naturopathic Doctor News and Review on the topics of hormone testing and cardiovascular testing. Thank you, Dr. Paz, and thank you all of you out there for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about DHEA metabolism, about a number of functions of DHEA beyond providing a substrate reservoir for estrogen and testosterone, look at DHEA and cancer, discuss how to measure DHEA levels in your patients, and look at some ways to improve DHEA levels. And we'll have time for questions and answers. You are welcome to ask questions at any time. Just type your question in, and I'll try to answer them as we go to the extent that I can. Also, at the end of the webinar, I will give you the answer to the one question we are always asked. How do I get a copy of today's slides? But you have to stick around to the end of the webinar for that. DHEA is a 19-carbon endogenous steroid. It's the most abundant circulating hormone in the human body, and in, uh, in not only in humans, but in mammals, other mammals. It's formed primarily in the adrenal cortex and also formed in the ovaries, testes, and in the brain. It serves as a substrate for the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and their metabolites. It's also considered a neurosteroid and has numerous effects in the brain and central nervous system. There has yet to be a specific DHEA receptor site identified, um, and as we'll see later, recent research may be closing in on identifying such a receptor. Low levels of DHEA are found with all major diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, autoimmune conditions, and others. Partly because there's been no receptor identified, it has sometimes been proposed that the diseases associated with low DHEA levels are merely a result of lower levels of sex hormones and not direct, directly attributable to DHEA deficiency. And while this may certainly be part of the story, it's becoming clearer that DHEA has many important functions apart from being a substrate reservoir. A brief review of DHEA metabolism, metabolism here. Pregnenolone is made from cholesterol, of course, and then goes through the intermediate 17-hydroxypregnenolone and then to DHEA. DHEA is then metabolized to androstenedione, which in turn metabolizes to testosterone and to the estrogens. Androstenedione also metabolizes to androsterone and etiocholanolone via the 5-alpha and 5-beta reductase pathways, and we generally consider those to be DHEA metabolites. And this is how DHEA and its metabolites show up on the 24-hour urine hormone panel. There is a secondary pathway to androstenedione, testosterone, and the estrogens, which does not require DHEA, and that's from progesterone via 17-hydroxyprogesterone to androstenedione. That's not a major pathway. DHEA sulfite is a metabolite of DHEA produced by adding a sulfate group. This conversion is reversibly catalyzed by the sulfotransferase enzymes. And I'm only showing it go one way here, because that's generally what it does. Normal internal biosynthesis of DHEA introduces a fair amount of it into the bloodstream, unsulfonated. 
it's distributed to every cell in the body where further metabolism takes place. Endogenous DHEA is sulfonated primarily in the zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex. Even though there's a significant amount of unsulfonated DHEA released, released into circulation, DHEA sulfate levels are about 300 times higher than those of free DHEA. Whereas DHEA levels naturally reach their peak in the early morning hours, DHEA sulfate levels show no diurnal variation, which is why many people feel that it's a better measure of DHEA status. However, while DHEA sulfate is more stable, it may not be the better measure. Oral DHEA is sulfonated in the intestines, in the small intestines, and in the first pass through the liver. Theoretically, some of that will be desulfonated and converted back to DHEA, but there is some evidence that not much desulfonation actually occurs. DHEA sulfate can also be back converted to DHEA through the action of steroid sulfatase. It appears that some people may have a decreased ability to desulfonate their DHEA, either because of decreased activity of the steroid sulfatase enzyme or perhaps because of insufficient steroid sulfatase levels. Transmucosal and transdermal uh, DHEA applications are absorbed directly into the blood vessels, avoiding the first pass through the liver. A large amount of it will be, con will be converted to DHEA sulfate as it passes through the liver and other tissues capable of sulfonation in normal circulation. But transdermal and especially transmucosal forms give you the best delivery of unsulfonated DHEA to the tissues. And sublingual delivery, which is a form of transmucosal can also provide very good absorption. It depends on a number of variables, including the form of the sublingual DHEA and how long the patient is able to keep it under their tongue without swallowing it, at which time it becomes an oral dose. DHEA is high at birth and declines precipitously to low levels in early childhood, starts to rise again in prepuberty, and continues to climb until it peaks at the age of 20 to 25. By 30, it's starting to decline, and by 65, it's 20 to 25 percent of its peak. However, studies of healthy 80 to 100-year-olds indicate that these um, healthy elders maintain, without supplementation, unusually high levels when compared to the overall population of the same age. Stephen Chernisky, a researcher who wrote the DHEA breakthrough back in the late 1990s, called DHEA the most comprehensive repair signal in the human body. It certainly makes sense that those healthy, active octogenarians and centenarians that we were talking about a moment ago have relatively high levels of a hormone that supports repair, regeneration, and building of tissue. DHA has been found to be lower in obese women than in lean controls. It stimulates lipolysis, and researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, have concluded that increasing fat deposits as one ages may be due to declining carnitine-driven fatty acid oxidation. And that declining carnitine-driven fatty acid oxidation correlates with the age-related decline of DHEA. In human clinical trials, DHEA supplementation has been shown to promote muscle mass when used in conjunction with resistance training. Also in human clinical trials, DHEA supplementation has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity and therefore improves, improves glucose control. A 2007 study found that DHEA restored oxidative balance in diabetic patients, reducing tissue levels of pentosidine, a biomarker for advanced glycation end products, you know, the age products that we've uh, learned about. And lower DHEA levels are associated with increasing risk of a cardiovascular event in diabetic patients. Cardiovascular disease. Um, this is a retrospective study. They looked at um, men with 49 male survivors of premature myocardial infarction and then 49 age-matched controls. 
men who were taking medications that might alter lipid, lipoprotein, or hormone levels were excluded from the study. DHA levels were significantly lower in the myocardial inf infarction patients, the MI patients, and this remained significant after controlling for, let's see, controlling for cholesterol, total cholesterol, triglycerides, the ratio of total to uh, HDL cholesterol, HDL by itself, apolipoprotein A1 and A2, apolipoprotein B, and body mass index. So after controlling for multiple uh, risk factors, this uh, was still a significant result. There were no significant differences in the levels of estradiol, testosterone, or free testosterone, or the ratio of estradiol to testosterone between patients and control subjects, which would seem to argue for the effect being one of DHEA itself rather than as a substrate for sex hormones. The researcher concluded that DHEA sulfate levels are inversely related to premature MI in males and that this association is independent of several known risk factors for premature myocardial infarction. There's a lot of research being done in the effects of DHEA on the cardiovascular system. This is one area where they may be homing in on a specific DHEA receptor. Among other actions, DHA protects the arterioles by regulating the growth and the functioning of endothelial cells, improves blood flow, acts as an antioxidant, and enhances nitric oxide availability. DHA is inversely correlated with the extent of coronary artery disease. That is, the less DHA that an individual has, the more damage they have. And low DHA is also associated with acute MIs. And this from the journal Gerontology. DHEA is able to ameliorate the function of nitric oxide-related signal pathways and delay the aging process of the blood vessels. I thought that was very interesting. Delay the aging process of the blood vessels. Okay, DHEA and stress. This is a, uh, an animal study. Um, they used rats. Actually, this is several animal studies. DHA reduced anxiety in a maze test in rats. Uh, in mice, it increased, uh, it decreased the sensitivity to noise, to excessive noise. Uh, it also attenuates the elevation of corticosterone produced by subjecting subjecting rats to cold stress. And then in volunteers, in, uh, in human volunteers, we found that DHA makes uh, volunteers mean age of 54 more relaxed and more resistant to stress. DHA and depression. We have a couple studies here. Um, 20, this one is 22 patients, so it's a small study, age 33 to 53, with major depression, DHEA, you can see the, um, the doses that they were taking, um, and that it increased over time. Um, and they had a 50% or greater decrease in symptoms in the DHEA group. Patients with low plasma DHEA, um, this is a second study, had uh, also taking 30 to 90 milligrams daily. They had significant improvement after two to three weeks, and improvement was more pronounced after four weeks. Okay, this is a crossover study in which the treatment group took 30 milligrams of DHEA TID for three weeks, followed by 150 milligrams TID for three weeks. That's a pretty hefty dose. There was a two-week washout period, and then the placebo group became the treatment group and vice versa. Their average score on the standard depression rating scales was 13.5 out of 17 points at baseline, and the higher the rating, the more depression. And as you can see, after taking DHEA, symptoms were significantly reduced compared to slightly reduced for placebo. The p-value for DHEA was 0 0.01 compared to baseline and compared to placebo. There were no adverse effects other than one woman who had a moderate increase in oily skin. 
And there, and then there were uh, 13 patients who continued, of the ones who responded, 13 of them continued DHA for six months, and 10 of those remained de depression-free. DHEA treatment had a positive impact on overall quality of life in a small clinical trial of 40 patients with full-blown AIDS, although the research on this study recommended against using it for AIDS patients. This is what they said. Because there appeared to be no benefit with regard to lean muscle mass, bone de density, or bone density in the DHEA recipients, DHEA supplementation Here's a quote now. In fully suppressed HIV patients was associated with an improvement in quality of life, but appeared to have no beneficial, uh, no beneficial antiviral, immunomodulatory, hormonal, or body composition effects, suggesting that it not be routine, routinely used as an adjunctive therapy in this population. Um, I'm not sure why they thought that quality of life was not a significant endpoint, but we might think differently about that. In other studies, it's been shown to improve cognitive function, mood, and mental health. And women uh, with naturally high DHA levels, uh, that's been associated with higher cognitive function. DHA and addiction. Studies done looking at DHA supplementation with both cocaine and heroin addicts found that DHA decreased the stress of withdrawal, resulting in increased completion of the detox program in the heroin addicts and decreased relapse in both types of addicts. DHA and osteoporosis. DHA has been shown to decrease bone loss, and it does this by down-regulating cytokines that are responsible for resorption of bone and by upregulating genes that influence bone formation. In one study of 105 women aged 45 to 69, 50 had normal bone density and 55 had osteoporosis. The osteoporosis group had 60% lower levels of DHEA. Uh, women with low DHA were 40 times more likely to have osteoporosis. Interestingly, estradiol levels were not associated with bone density. And this looks at the effect of 12-month DHEA replacement therapy on bone, vagina, and endometrium in postmenopausal women. This is from the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Um, 14 women were treated with approximately 300 to 500 milligrams of DHEA a day for 12 months. That's a lot of DHEA. DHEA stimulated vaginal epithelial maturation in 11 women, thereby, thereby decreasing their vaginal atrophy. It did not cause endometrial proliferation. Bone density increased by 2.1% after 12 months of treatment. Increase in serum osteocalcin, a marker of bone formation, and um, w uh, was also seen, and there was also a reduction in urinary hydroxyproline, which is a marker of bone resorption. There were no significant side effects, even at those high doses. And in this study, DHEA increased bone mineral density in women. This study of 280 women and men aged 60 to 79 took 50 milligrams of DHEA. Women had an increase in bone mineral density after one year, but this effect was not seen in men. Women in the placebo group had a decrease in bone mineral density. In women over 70 who took DHEA, there was a decrease of 11% in bone markers for absorption a resorption after six months and a 26% decrease after 12 months. That's pretty significant. Now, I didn't put the uh, graph on here for the men, but uh, they didn't see these differences with men. Uh, and in a couple of more recent studies from 2008 and 2009, also imp reported improvement in bone mineral density in women using DHEA, but not in men. DHEA and asthma. DHEA is able to reverse cytokine imbalances associated with asthma, and it may prevent and attenuate allergic inflammation in the airways. And it doesn't have the undesirable side effects of glucocorticoids. One study concluded the steroid-sparing effect observed with DHEA clinically 
could appear especially favorable in asthmatic patients receiving oral treatment and those inhaling high doses of glucocorticoids. In addition, DHEA might prove useful in reversing relative glucocorticoid insensitivity in patients with corticosteroid resistant, resistant asthma. So something there for you who have patients with asthma, that might be something to look at. DHEA and autoimmune disorders. There have been a number of different studies that have looked at DHEA specifically in women with lupus, and I believe there's some others uh, uh, some other studies out there with autoimmune diseases, but those are the ones that I found most easily. Um, the dosages were from 50 to 200 milligrams daily, again, fairly high doses for a woman, and there did seem to be a dose-dependent response. Another thing that um, I came across which was quite interesting, the use of DHEA is being investigated in the treatment of hemorrhage due to trauma and sepsis and in sepsis with very positive results. Um, these are animal studies so far, but given the absence of any serious side effects being associated with DHEA supplementation, the addition of DHEA to the treatment of severe, severely ill patients may be helpful and is highly unlikely to be harmful. I'll just give you a couple more seconds if you want to read that slide. DHEA and aging. Uh, DHEA decreased the dose of growth hormone needed to maintain IGF-1 levels in women diagnosed with a adult growth hormone deficiency. This was maintained throughout the 12 months of the study and declined after discontinuing DHEA at the end of the treatment period. In another study, Topical DHEA improved skin brightness, decreased the papery appearance of skin, and increased sebum production, which typically declines with age. This was a 1% formulation applied to face and hands for four months. Two small crossover studies for adult with adults over 40 and over 50 taking a single nightly dose of DHEA for six months. Um, and they did not specify, or I don't have here, the exact dose, but they reported remarkably improved ability to cope with stress, reduced joint pain, increased joint mobility, improved sleep, increased lean body mass, and men had increased muscle strength and decreased fat. So DHEA really is a multidimensional hormone. I like this quote from um, the Journal of Sexual Medicine. I think it summed it up pretty well. DHEA modulates endothelial function, reduces inflammation, improves insulin sensitivity, blood flow, cellular immunity, body composition, bone metabolism, sexual function, and physical strength and frailty and provides neuroprotection, improves cognitive function, and memory enhancement. DHEA possesses pleiotropic effects, and reduced levels of DHEA and DHEA sulfate may be associated with a host of pathologies. Now, I kind of had to laugh when I got to the end of it because they had one more sentence, which was, However, the clinical efficacy of DHEA supplementation in ameliorating pathophysiological symptoms remains to be evaluated. Okay, here's the big one. Does DHEA cause cancer? Everything I'd heard or read had led me to believe that it's the opposite, that DHEA is protective against cancer. So I was a little surprised when I came across this study. This was a meta-analysis of... Uh, nine prospective studies. Uh, they included only women who were not currently using any supplemental hormones. Uh, they looked at endogenous levels of estradiol, estrone, testosterone, androstenedione, DHEA, and DHEA sulfate. And they also measured sex hormone binding globulin. The patients were stratified by quintiles from lowest to highest levels of each hormone. Those in the lowest level lowest quintile were assigned a relative risk of 1 as a reference point. 
Those in the highest quintile did have an increased risk of developing breast cancer over those in the lowest quintile. The range of increased risk was between 1.75 and 2.58, depending on the hormone being measured. Those women with the highest sex hormone binding globulin had the lowest risk, um, had a lower risk than those in the lowest quintile. But there's more to the story than this, because right now this looks like, oh, higher levels of hormones, any of these hormones, may be associated with an increased risk. But when you go through and beyond the abstract and you look at the entire study, you find that for all hormones except for DHEA, women with previous hormone replacement therapy had lower relative risk than women who had no previous hormone replacement therapy. And for DHEA, the relative, relative risk was about the same for previous hormone replacement therapy and no previous hormone replacement therapy. We're talking about 1.39 versus 1.38. So that's essentially the same. Um, not, a, not a significant difference. Um, so what does this mean? Um, I'm not sure what it means, and the this authors of the study didn't really discuss that particularly. Um, but one of the things it may mean is that we may need to watch out for using very high doses of DHEA. Even though some of the studies that we looked at, um, people were using, the researchers were using very high doses, that may not be the safest thing to do in the long run, and we usually recommend using physiological doses. But what else is there about DHEA and cancer? So in these studies, DHEA was seen to <clears throat> induce apoptosis in malignant cells and to induce cell cycle arrest, effectively inhibiting proliferation of cells. In another study, DHEA controlled hyperplasia in the smooth muscle of the lung. It's been found to have very similar effects in terms of cell regulation and anti-cancer effects as calorie restriction. And finally, in the first study mentioned above, the anti-proliferative effects of DHEA on tumor cell lines were much stronger than those of DHEA sulfate. So someone who can't convert their DHEA sulfate back to DHEA efficiently may not get the same level of protection um, as from DHEA as someone else. And it's another reason why we might want to be looking at DHEA levels rather than just DHEA sulfate. This was a long-term uh, study effect, looking at the effect, effect of DHEA on mammary tissue in rats and monkeys. They use very, very high doses of uh, DHEA. Um, the, there was a three-fold inc increase in testosterone. There was no increase in estradiol, and there were no changes to the tissue, the histological changes in mammary tissue, so no signs of there being any kind of hyperplasia or decreased differentiation, those kinds of things. This is another one on rats uh, with induced mammary cancer. There was a dose-dependent response. Uh, the more DHEA they got, the fewer tumors they got. Also, a uh, dose-dependent re response in terms of tumor size. The more DHEA they got, the smaller the tumors were. The authors of the study concluded present data indicate that circulating levels of DHEA similar to those found in normal adult premenopausal women exert a potential inhibitory effect on the development of induced mammary tumors in the rat, thus suggesting the possibility of a new and more physiological approach for the prevention of breast cancer in women. And this, uh, just to reiterate, since I didn't say that at the beginning of this, in this study, they used doses that would be equivalent to physiological doses in women. This uh, preliminary study evaluated the daily secretion of DHEAS sulfate in uh, a group of early and advanced cancer, cancer patients. The study included 70 patients with solid tumors, including GI tumors, uh, 28, 
breast cancer tumor is 24, and non-small cell lung cancer tumor is 18. Um, 28 without and, 20, and 42 with distant metastases, and the control group consisted of 100 age and sex matched healthy subjects. There was no significant difference in mean serum levels of DHEA between controls and non-metastatic patients. In contrast, metastatic patients, regardless of the tumor type, so we're not talking about just um, breast cancer here, we're talking about all the tumor types, the metastatic patients showed significantly lower mean levels of DHEA with respect to either controls or non-metastatic patients. Moreover, the metastatic patients with visceral locations showed significantly lower values of DHEA sulfate than those with bone or soft tissue metastases. The study's authors have concluded these, that these findings suggest that there is a deficiency in the daily DHEA secretion in patients with disseminated cancer. This was a study on DHEA in mice with induced cervical cancer. Again, a dose-dependent response. Uh, the more DHEA uh, the mice got, the lower the uh, the the less tumor development they had. So it was quite high, tumor development was quite high in control animals, and when we got up to a 0.1%, it was down to 14.2% of tumor development. There are many more studies out there showing low DHEA levels associated with cancer in humans and the use of physiological or sometimes superphysiological levels of DHEA to prevent tumor formation in animals. Um, there are also a few studies that show DHEA used in animals associated with the development of cancer, such as one in which a great majority of the animals developed liver tumors after DHEA administration. In these cases, if you figure out the equivalent dose in a 150-pound human, you see that the doses being used are many times that the physiological dose, sometimes thousands of times more than would be used therapeutically. The other case I found, and I've heard this one quoted a number of times um, in uh, opposition to the use of DHEA, um, is of tumors being induced in DHEA in rainbow trout. And rainbow trout don't naturally produce DHEA at all. So, and this was also at extremely high doses. So I don't really think that that is useful in terms of looking at whether or not DHEA would promote cancer in human beings. So do we want to look at DHEA or DHEA sulfate? The majority of DHEA, as we know, is, consider, is converted to DHEA sulfate, and most researchers don't distinguish between the two. Um, does DHEA sulfate serve as a reservoir of weakly bound DHEA? Yes, it may, but it may not be fully metabolically available. This is a study of 108 seropositive HIV seropositive men. All of them had low CD4 lymphocytes. DHEA levels predicted which men would progress to AIDS. DHEA sulfate levels didn't. In this study, they looked at elderly subjects with low DHEA. They were administered ACTH. DHEA levels increased. DHEA levels DHEA sulfate levels increased significantly less. And in both young and older subjects with low DHEA, they uh, administered corticotropin releasing factor. DHEA levels increased 60%. DHEA sulfate levels did not increase. So the question here is, is DHEA sulfate actually a, a useful measure for us? Now we also want to look at saliva, urine, or serum, which is the best way to measure it. In saliva, you're going to get a combination of DHEA and DHEA sulfate. So it's really hard to assess the bioavailability because you don't know how much you have of which. Um, 
In urine, you're also going to be getting a combination of DHEA and DHEA sulfate. However, in urine, we look at the DHEA metabolites, and that allows us to assess, assess the DHEA. In serum, you can, you can order DHEA separately from DHEs, of course. An early morning draw is best. Um, you should centrifuge in a serum separator tube within an hour of the draw and refrigerate the serum tube. Um, and ship on ice overnight if you're shipping to Meridian Valley Lab. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. So, there, so I would say basically saliva is not a very useful way to look at DHEA. Um, uh, with the per, perhaps the ex exception of if you're looking at it in comparison to cortisol and a four-point cortisol. Uh, so if you're looking at the pattern. But although DHA has a diurnal pattern, the difference throughout the day in DHA is much smaller than the difference in cortisol throughout the day. So there may be some usefulness there. But urine uh, is a very uh, useful assessment because you can look at the metabolites and serum, you can also order DHEA separately from DHEA sulfate as long as you uh, draw it properly and process it properly. So improving endogenous DHEA. Uh, meditation is an important thing. I listed some programs here, Holosync, In a Peace, Life Flow. There's some others out there. These are programs that use... Uh, uh, tones that you that are played uh, through headphones that people listen to through headphones and the reason I mention these is because I, I have some experience with Holosync I have less experience with the other two um, but I know that uh, these kinds of programs have been demonstrated to increase DHEA production also increase melatonin production and decrease cortisol if it is too high so, uh, and, and the effect of meditation on improving DHA levels is very well established. Um, another resource that I recommend sometimes to patients is a, a company called healthjourneys.com. They have um, a, a wonderful set of uh, guided imagery tapes, uh, CDs, and MP3s for a wide variety of conditions and stress related. So that might be something helpful for your patients also. Stress reduction programs, so uh, guided imagery, imagery as I just mentioned, Tai Chi, and this looks like, this looks like my favorite kind of stress reduction program. Physical exercise, and we're talking here about high intensity, short duration exercise. Calorie restriction can also improve endogenous DHEA. Um, caloric restriction of 8 to 11 percent um, can make a marked difference in inflammatory markers. And based on 2,000 calories a day, this would, a day, this would be reduced to 1780 to 1840 calories a day. So not really a huge amount. Improving sleep is very important. Um, improving sleep and optimizing other hormones will improve growth hormone, which is also beneficial for improving DHEA. Progesterone improves DHEA. This is from the Sheely Institute. Uh, Norm Sheely reported that a 3% natural progesterone cream increased DHEA levels in patients from 40 to 100%. He also reported using a gigatens unit to the ring of fire acupuncture points to increase DHEA by 56%. Um, and I'll show you those points in just a moment. He used yet another uh, unit, the Sheely Pain Control Unit, also to the ring of fire uh, with even greater results, a 63% increase in DHEA. And here's a map of the 12 points used for the ring of fire treatments. If you um, are an acupuncturist, if you do acupuncture, or if you have an acupuncturist working with you in your practice. And finally, Dr. Sheely reported that the combination of pre progesterone and the gigatens unit increased DHA levels an average of 93%.
Okay, DHA supplementation, route of administration is important. Oral, as we know, is almost all converted to DHA, and how much of that is going to be available, we don't know. Uh, sublingual, transdermal, and mucos transmucosal are all um, good routes. I would say probably transmucosal and sublingual would be my preferred. Transdermal, sometimes you don't get as good absorption as you do with uh, the uh, transmosal, transmucosal and sublingual. Um, sublingual, of course, is uh, just another type of transmucosal. And um, the, the, the thing to watch out for with sublingual, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, is the preparation you're using. If it, if it isn't, isn't absorbed fairly rapidly, um, and fairly well, then the patient's going to end up swallowing a lot of it, and then it's just an oral dose. We always want to be using physiological dosing. For men, that's 25 to 50 milligrams. If you're talking about sublingual for women, 5 to 15 milligrams. Um, these are dosages that we generally consider physiological. Uh, transmucosal or transdermal, you want to probably at least double those dosages. Um, some patients may tolerate and, in fact, need higher dosages, but this is where we would typically start. And for most patients, those doses are adequate to improve both symptoms and lab values. Now, when we're talking about doing a transdermal or transmucosal um, application, we want to make sure that we're asking our compounding pharmacist to concentrate the dose into the tiniest amount of cream possible. I'm talking about like 0.1 ml or 0.2 mls at the most. Because if you're applying it to the um, uh, labia majora, to the mucosal surface of the labia majora in women, or the anal mucosa in men, that's a very small surface area. And if you put on a whole gram of cream, that is, it's all going to sit on the surface, and plus they're not going to like it very much. Something to consider in looking and uh, determining DHEA levels is 5-alpha reductase activity. It's important to check that, which is part of the 24-hour urine hormone panel. Uh, high 5-alpha reductase increases side effects in women. Um, there are some good 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, zinc, GLA, sal palmetto, um, probably more for men than for women, um, but it, it can work in women also. Um, low 5-alpha reductase activity, on the other hand, people may, people, people may need slightly higher doses. So if you're starting someone on, fi, on DHEA and they have high 5-alpha reductase activity, like you see here, um, you may want to start them on some 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like zinc and GLA first, get that on board for a week or two, and then add in the DHEA to minimize any likelihood of side effects. And this is the area that we consider um, the optimal range for 5-alpha reductase activity. So DHA in summary, impro improves bone density, mood and cognitive function, response to stress, response to infection, insulin sensitivity, lean body mass, decreases cancer risk, cardiovascular risk, and uh, mitigates the adverse effects of glucocorticoids in those people who have to be taking them. We want to use it in physiological doses, as we were just talking about. Monitor in the 24-hour urine to evaluate metabolites. Monitor in serum with proper handling. Oral may not be as effective. Transdermal is better. Transmucosal or sublingual is best. And if there are any other questions, I'll take those now. Okay, I see I have a question here. Do women or men with no sexual glands have a deficiency of DHEA? I'm assuming that what you mean by that is, uh, say, a woman who's had a hysterectomy and has had her ovaries removed, um, or a man, a man who may have um, had his 
testes removed for some reason. Um, I don't see any reason why they should have a deficiency of DHEA um, because it's primarily produced in the in the adrenal glands. Yes, it is produced somewhat in the in the gonads, but primarily in the adrenal glands. Um, there may there may be some uh, decrease just because the, the hormones may not be optimized overall, but I wouldn't necessarily expect that. Another question here: Is seven keto DHEA okay to use? Um, that's a question that we have debated here. Um, I personally feel that there may be some places for it. It is something that is produced naturally in the body, um, and it is past the point in uh, the metabolic pathway where it um, uh, goes to estrogen or testosterone. So if there's a concern about raising the levels of those hormones, um, then 7-keto might be okay to use. Um, I have uh, some years back uh, read a paper which talked about people using DHEA um, or 7-keto DHEA. And for some people, 7-keto DHEA made a much more profound difference in their sense of well-being, whereas for other people, it was the opposite was true. So it may be something to try out with your patients. I noticed um, I've noticed that 7-keto tends to be used in higher doses for weight loss. I'm not sure um, uh, if that's a good idea or not. Oh, and I have a comment here. Um, somebody says the problem with using 7-keto DHEA is that you can't test the levels. That may be true. There, I'm not aware of any tests out there for that. Here's another question, DHE in men, do we need to be concerned about conversion to estrogen? Well, yes, to a certain extent, because um, DHA will convert to testosterone um, and to androstenedione, both of which will aromatize. So if you have a man who is already hyper-aromatizing, a man who um, has a uh, you know, big belly, maybe start, starting to develop some breasts, um, a, a man who has a low testosterone to estrogen ratio, um, that's a man who's over-aromatizing, and DHA could fuel that even further. On the other hand, that over-aromatization is associated with insulin resistance, and we know that DHA can improve insulin sensitivity. So I wouldn't necessarily withhold DHA from a man like that, but I would make sure that I'm doing what I need to do to um, deal with in issues of insulin resistance and sensitivity and lifestyle, all those other things that you would do. I have a question here. Does donating plasma lower your levels of DHEA? Well, I would imagine that Donating plasma would lower levels of anything that you have circulating in plasma, at least temporarily. But if you're healthy, your body should be producing more DHEA and replenishing those stores in your plasma, just as you would re, uh, produce more red blood cells. And if you were giving uh, donating whole blood, those red blood cells would also be um, uh, replaced. Is it okay to take DHEA if you have an autoimmune disorder, Sjogren's syndrome? Yes, I don't see any reason why not. Like I said, we had I showed some uh, that one slide that talked about DHEA with women who have lupus. Um, I'm not aware of anything that says that that's a bad idea. Um, I think it actually might be very helpful. Okay, I'm just going to. Give you another few seconds here for questions. I don't see any, so I'm going to move on. Thank you for participating in our webinar today. I hope you found it to be useful to you. If you want to set up an account with Meridian Valley Lab, if you're not already a customer, I invite you to set up an account with us and try our tests. When you sign up as a new customer, you'll receive 50% off our most comprehensive hormone panel for your personal use, 
or you can use that 50% off another of the tests that Meridian Valley does in-house, such as our food allergy panels or the blood viscosity test. Also, we want to let you know that every test you do comes with a free consult with one of our consulting physicians. There are four of us on staff, and we're here to answer your questions about the best test to order for your patients and to help you interpret the results and recommend treatments when you get the results. I promised you at the beginning that I would tell you how to get a copy of the slides at the end of the presentation. So you're going to be getting an email from Meridian Valley Lab later today. Open it and click on the link to the webinar survey. It's a short survey, shouldn't take you more than about five minutes, unless you have a lot you want to say. Complete the survey online and submit it, and as our thank you to you for your feedback, we'll send you a PDF copy of the presentation. Thank you again for participating in our webinar today, and don't forget to register for next, year's, next month's webinar on Advanced Female Bioidentical Hormone Replacement Therapy, presented by Dr. Leah Paz, our Senior Consulting Physician, and that will be broadcast on February 21st at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. Thank you very much.